Welcome to the Motivated Martial Arts Podcast. Your hosts, Jackson White and Gavin Cook, have been friends and Taekwondo training partners for over 40 years. This podcast will bring you a mixture of their life stories, martial arts, and business experiences to motivate you in life and throughout your martial arts journey. Adding in a mixture of inspiring interviews and some of the best traditional martial artists around today. So over to your hosts, the Motivated Martial Artists. Welcome to the Motivated Martial Artists podcast with me, Gavin Cook. And me, Jackson White. And today we've got uh, Neil McLeod on the show. So Neil is a, uh, a Jeet Kune Do and um, Filipino specialist. You'll probably correct me in a minute when I, uh, <laughs> when I speak to him properly. Um, based in Ellsbury, and we're really chuffed to get uh, Neil on the show. You'll, if, you're a, if you're on your Facebook feed, if you've, if you've not got him, he pops up every, every couple of minutes beating his wife up in the kitchen in lockdown. So interested to know what that's all about. <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. It's a pleasure. Yeah, good. So I'll kick off with the first question then. So can you just give us a bit of a, an insight to your background, where you grew up, your schooling, and I suppose ultimately how, how that led to you getting into martial arts? Right, I, I grew up in Scotland. I was born just south of Glasgow, uh, lived in a, a town called Carluk and lived there for the first eight years of my life. And then in 1981, my father, who was working for British Rail at the time, his job was moved to London. So we moved down south to Aylesbury from Scotland in 81. I was going to say, you didn't, you didn't don't seem to have carried that Scottish twang with you, you know, on that journey. You know, what, you know what? It was really funny because when I did move down, I still had the Scottish accent, but I was still, uh, I, I could be, very impressed in some way do you know what i mean i could be slanted so uh -huh. i started to lose the accent and i got this real kind of aylesbury aylesbury accent come out and i remember my mother actually telling me off saying speak properly speak properly and I, <laughs> my accent just changed so now i've just got i don't know it's a mix of cockney scottish and uh out in the country <laughs> just checking you know i've got a kilt on uh, no i got married in a kilt though i, I i've got i did get married in my kilt it's not, it's not very good for high kicks, though, is it? <laughs> well, it's perfect for high kicks, actually, but uh, <laughs> the shock value might help. <laughs> uh, depending, depending on your choice of underwear, I should imagine. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> underwear? What are you exactly. And I was going to say, it's, 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 there's, there's a true Scotsman, you, know, you don't ask that question, what's under yeah. there? That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you moved, you moved down south then? Moved down south. Uh, we were kind of a, I'd say... We were somewhere between working class, middle class family. So we, weren't, we didn't have any money when we moved south. We had absolutely no money. So without telling a lie, it was beans on toast for a good year or so. Uh, I, think, that, I think that was the 80s though, wasn't it? I yeah, think that was yeah. for most families in the early 80s. It was either, it was either mince or squash. Mince and, and squash, that's, that's all I remember. That's all I used to have. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't particularly well off, but uh, I was always active, always an active child and always into fitness. I was always going for runs, climbing trees, the usual stuff, taking risks, jumping off buildings, playing on building sites, usual, usual kid, right? So my Scottish life, we used to scrap a lot as kids as play fighting, you know, almost like animals and dogs. They, they scrap with each other, but it's all playful. So we'd do that. And that was kind of normal in Scotland to, yeah. I don't know what it was like down South, but certainly in Scotland, that was, that was normal. And obviously it'd elevate and someone would cry and get injured and that, but you'd still be buds. And then you'd repeat, you know, rinse, repeat, yeah. rinse, repeat. So that was normal in Scotland. Okay. Uh, when I moved down to England, it didn't seem that was the case. It didn't seem that that was the case. But uh, so anyway, so far as martial arts goes, coming down from Scotland, the bullying started. I had the accent, so there was some bullying. There wasn't so much physical bullying. It was very much psychological bullying. Sure. So it started early on with the slow drip adrenaline. That started quite early on from moving down from Scotland. And then... Uh, as that increased, the Karate Kid came out. <laughs> karate Kid number one. And that was it. I was like... You can see where this is going now. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, I could do that. I, I mean, it's the same story for a lot of people my age, I think. That came out and it's like, I could relate to that. And I think a lot of people who done, who do martial arts or were martial artists could relate to that. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? We could relate to that because 
if we're all honest, we're all insecure. That's why we've taken up martial arts. There's some insecurity in us, and that's why we've taken up martial arts. You know, there, there is just something. It could be just a slight part of our personality that, you know, we're a bit insecure about. Martial arts kind of fills that and helps that, I think. So the karate, the karate kid was the start, and then you had no retreat, no surrender, and all that. Blood sport, kickboxer. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Those were the days, and I was very, also very much into the, uh, the Chinese films at the time. I had some friends in the Chinese community in Aylesbury. So we got all the bootleg VHS of all, all the Donnie Yen movies. Yeah. Yeah. Minor Duty 4, Tiger Cage 2, all that sort of stuff. Brilliant. Great days. Classics. Classics. Good times. So what was the, uh, what was the first uh, martial arts that you joined them? The, the first official martial art club that I joined was Wadoru Karate, and that was under a guy called Ed Mountney. He was under the Clayton Moraine organization. Okay. And uh, I think Ed Mountney's still teaching karate up north somewhere. I think he's, I think he's branched off and got his own organization. But uh, yeah, he was the first one. Now, I only done karate for about eight weeks max. And then just due to our life circumstances, I had, we had to quit. However, during that eight weeks, I trained every day for an hour. So I'd go for my hour class at the karate and then I'd repeat that for the rest of the week, an hour a day. And then I'd go back again. And what I noticed over that period of time is one, the instructor came up to me and he said, look, you're good enough to be graded a few grades now. You've only just joined, but you're good enough to be graded a few grades. However, you haven't put the, t you haven't done your time yet. You know, it's, yeah. it's just, and I understand that completely. You've got to make sure you do your time, pay your dues. That's, you know, that's part of the business. But um, I noticed that. That kind of triggered something. It was like, ah, so it's reps. It's how much you put in. What, what do you think it was? Do you think it was your personality that had, that, um, that made you train that much? You know, some. Yes, because I was always at, I was going to do something anyway. I was going to do something anyway. It's it was quite climbing. obsessive, isn't it? You know, it's quite obsessive to go into something like that. And yeah, especially I, in the early days before you've really reached a, you know, I, I understand how it obsessive it gets as you reach higher belts and you can feel yourself becoming good. But I mm. suppose in those early days when you first maybe could have been the bullion, who knows? Yeah, well, I, I, my brother had actually purchased a book uh, advertised in the martial arts magazines back then, how to be a karate black belt in 12 months. I don't know whether you remember that. It was a little advert in the back of the magazine. <laughs> That's what it was advertised as. And it was basically just a budget, really thin book. Half the book was actually just a, a diary. So you'd fill in your training each day and write your notes in there. So that, you know, it's one of those fill in your own, <laughs> excuse me, fill in your own books. However, the, when the book arrived for my brother, I took it. I took it and it said in there, it was, or the title of the book was actually Super Mind Training for Martial Arts by Dr. Dan Lee. And he was, had four black belts allegedly and all the lists of, you know, so he's a psychologist, he's a psychiatrist, he's whatever. And in there, it had your classic meditation, visualization, affirmation, self-hypnosis. It talked about the ninja kind of, changing emotions with all the hand positions yeah. it had triggers yeah. so it was very nlp ish orientated and listed all of the alleged studies oh this is proven in whatever whether these are true or not it didn't matter i was a 13 year old child i was a yeah, brought into child. it straight away and i just went okay so i've got to do that twice a day i've got to do this got to do that and i've got to do the physical training well because i stopped training i thought well actually i don't need to stop training I just keep training. So I set up a dojo in my parents' garage. I wasn't attending any martial arts class, but I was doing my self-hypnosis every day. I was doing my affirmations, all the incantations, all that kind of thing, all the reprogramming with a belief. And it was because this book, I, who was I to not believe this book? Did you have the tape? Did you have the self-hypnosis tape? No, no, I didn't, I didn't use any tapes at all. I yeah. didn't use any tapes at all. But I was... At the same time, I purchased Dawa Jeet Kune Do and realized how important philosophy was in this journey. So then I was buying books by Alan Watt, books <coughs> on, a Zen, you know, all the Zen books, uh, Lao Tzu, uh, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, all, the, all these uh, kind of books were, which were probably out of the ordinary for a 16-year-old, uh, sorry, a 13-year-old boy. I was getting into Qigong at that time. So I, I was kind of like trying to be a complete martial artist. And with movies like No Retreat, No Surrender coming out and stuff like that, it was kind of, 
you could mirror your life in a way. Do you know what I mean? As a child, you could you could play that role. So you set up your garage with all the equipment, etc. Yep. You know, so I was actually training just on my own. It wasn't until uh, I was 14 and a half. So it was a good two years I was training on my own in the garage. However, I became known amongst the community. I say the community, you're talking kids, right? You're talking just children across all the schools. I became known as one of the top martial artists in the area. And all the stories and legend of, legendary stories started to arise and <laughs> continue to this day. Just the hilarious stories. Kill, kill people with your little finger. And... Oh, yeah. Oh, they, they all arose. And it was like I was a kid. I was a skinny little kid training in the garage, you know, just living his dream. But um, I, did, I did then, after that, start training in Lao Ga Kung Fu. Uh, under Alvin Mighty, who was one of the top yes. freestyle yeah. guys. Remember Alvin? Oh, yeah. There was, yeah. you know, Alvin Mighty, Alfie Lewis, Kevin Brewer, and all those guys back in the day. Ast and Aston Lauga, Aston Lauga squad, wasn't it? Yes, that was uh, Mark Aston. Mark yeah. Aston, yeah. That's it. And so I, I was with Alvin. That school went on for a year and a half until it folded. Yeah, because he had to travel from Banbury. It was a bit of a journey, I think. So it, the school folded. So I was left again with nothing. So then I decided if I want to get good at this, I'm going to have to take it seriously. I've got to get out of my hometown. Luckily, my dad working for British Rail, I got free travel on British Rail. So I decided I'm going to start training in London. And by that time, I'd bought all the Bruce Lee books. I Bruce, knew Bruce Lee's fighting method, one, two, three, four. Yeah, had all them. And it was They're like, great. Inner Santo was my dream. To meet him was my dream. But yeah. the path seemed to be, and I knew, <clears throat> I knew this bald guy in London, but Bob, Bobby, Bob, Bob, Bob something, Bob Green, Breen, Bob Breen, some sort of legend apparently taught Jeet Kune Do in this country. So uh, <laughs> I, I thought I'm going to take the path first and do Wing Chun, Okay. take the Bruce Lee role. So I started traveling to London on a Sunday afternoon uh, to train Wing Chun. I would have been 16 at this time now. So I was training with Austin Go. That continued for about a year and a half, two years. And then I decided to make the move over to study Jeet Kune Do. Uh -huh. Now, my introduction to a... Uh, did you guys want to chirp in anywhere? Or did you just want to listen no, to me? No, we just want to listen to you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, people I'm don't want to hear day. about us. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but, but from, from then, uh, uh, Lauren Avedon and Donnie Yen were both were teaching seminars, going on a tour. And they were both scheduled at the Bob Breen Academy, or the Academy as it was known back then, where Bob Breen was teaching Jeet Kune Do. So I went down to train with Donnie Yen for a day, which was fantastic. You know, I love this guy. As me, as 16-year-old kid, and all oh, this is kicking off. It, it was brilliant. It was, it was great. And then there was, and this was long before Hollywood, obviously. Sure. And then there was uh, Lauren Aveton, who turned up half hour early for the seminar, as did I. And I got a good 15, 20 minute, half hour chat with him alone in the changing room. So it was me with King of the Kickboxers. Like it was brilliant. Loved it. Loved it. it was fantastic days. And then uh, from there, I took the timetable from the academy, from Bob's Academy, went away, phoned them up and got going. And then uh, that was my journey into Jeet Kune Do, meeting Bob Breen. I joined that. That was 91. I started with Bob Breen. 1991. Oh, yeah. Okay. So how old are you then? Probably, what, 16? 17 i was 17 it was may 91 i was 17 uh turning 18 in october so i was 17 then right brilliant good stuff well, so, go on, i was gonna say so obviously it's that sort of age isn't it sort of 17 18 where girls start to appear on the scene and and shall i go shall i go to the pub you know was there any did you have any sort of um pulls from that end or was you really being quite strict to your to your to the you art know, drink wise I'd have a drink now and again uh, in my 20s. I really, I really didn't touch anything naughty at all until I was 21. It was, it was around like my 20s, I'd say, because when I was a teenager, it was just martial arts. Martial arts. Yeah, That's a bit like you going, isn't it? Yeah, I think my yeah. late just teens... The same. Yeah, just to say, I did exactly what you did. I converted my mum and dad's garage and I had all the Bruce yeah. Lee books and I used to, you know, religiously, I used to go running around the country park and then do like... You know, do my run, then do my skipping. I used to do my skipping, straight in the garage, on the bag, on the speed yeah, pool. Yeah. And that was it. And that was that was my life, 15, 16 years old. And it's funny because all my friends were going to parties and 
and stuff like that. And I used, I still used to go to them, but I, I went training first. And I used, to, I used to be the one that turned up at like <coughs> ten o'clock at night, just as <laughs> it's absolute chaos. And they're all these fifteen year olds, <laughs> fifteen six year olds are absolutely plastered out their brains. And I turn up sober after doing training, thinking, what, you know, what is going on? What's going on here? Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd run to the party. I remember running eight miles to a party. <laughs> Go to the bike and then running eight miles back. So, so, what's going on? Just, so did, did you ever get involved in the competition side of, uh, of, of Lao, Lao Gar Kung Fu? Only once. I've done it once. And because of my age, because I was 14, that was the adult category. Mm -hmm. 14 to adults. Okay. So there was me, a skinny little like, nine and a half stone kid with huge guys. So, it, you know, it didn't go well. It didn't go well. I, I mean, apparently, my, I only had one fight. I only had one fight. And... I didn't like the the point scoring. It wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't my cup of tea. I didn't I didn't particularly like it. I could see the value of it though. I like the idea. Of, it teaches you that explosiveness of like yeah. uh, uh, that boom, that commitment for going in. Yeah. It teaches you that um, distance. It mm -hmm. teaches you distance, that. timing, and speed. Isn't it, it teaches you all that? It still teaches you all that. But it didn't appeal to me in that sense. So that's probably why I only done it once. Maybe that's not true because the club closed down and I then moved on to yeah. Wing Chun. So it could have been it could have been that as well. But it didn't make sense to me because in the training that I was doing myself, I was personally with my buddies doing continuous. Mm -hmm. It was all continuous and it was mixed with kind of boxing. So yeah. in our own training we were we were kit boxing, we were grappling. I mean I, I was I was inside someone's guard when I was thirteen years old on a concrete floor in my garage. Yeah. Not knowing what the guard was. This was like nineteen eighty six and didn't know what the guard was but i knew that when he squeezed his legs it hurt my ribs so i turned sideways and then it didn't hurt so i was like oh there you go so that was my first lesson there's, there's <laughs> a remedy yeah <laughs> brilliant brilliant so what uh, so what age did you start learning the one inch power punch i bet you did oh, i yeah. bet you i bet you learned it oh yeah that, <laughs> uh, now that was yeah that was in my early teens i had james demille's book yeah and i had my i had my big nescafe coffee can filled with sand <laughs> And I had it on a table and the table was up against the tree in my back garden. And I had an air shield so I wouldn't have to keep collecting it as I inch punched it across the table. <laughs> and, I, and I had it measured out on the table where I could mark how far I punched the, uh, the big tin across the table. And if I, my goal was to get it to, to the end of the table so it would bounce off the uh, air shield, which I got in the end. So, uh, yeah, I always used to do that. Yeah, Not anymore. Point. My mom was a little bit different. I used to take textbooks to school and get kids to hold them on their chest, like to hold like five or six textbooks while I tried to push them backwards across the field. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Great. So, 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 what was uh, what was next from that then? So you got into your G can do, got and um, where did where did that journey take you then? That that was it. That just opened the world because Bob Brain's Academy was so legendary back then. The classes were small because it, they were all brawlers. Everyone there could, they could motor. I mean, I, I can remember after one class, we went, to, we went to the pub around the corner and I wasn't a big drinker. So I was, I was 18, but I was like, with this beer, feeling a bit awkward because I, I wasn't socially, socially great in that sense. I always felt a bit, ooh, I don't like crowds. I don't like being around too many people in that sense. I just felt a bit awkward. I was very much myself, yeah. which, was, which was evident in my early days training. I'd be out playing bus 21, hide and seek football with my buddies. I'd look at my watch and go, look guys, I've got to go home for my hours training. I'd go home, do my hours training, come back and then continue playing football or whatever. Especially hide and seek, they're still, still hiding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's you've it. been, you've been ages. <laughs> you couldn't find us, you were ages. Yeah, I was rubbish at that game. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the Jeek and Do world just opened opened it up. So what was I saying? I was saying, yeah, I was in, I was in this pub with all these people and uh, I looked around and I was like, you know, if it kicked off, wow. I, these, these were the kind of guys you'd want behind you. They were, they were proper, yeah. proper geezers as it were. And nice, intelligent, all intelligent, all nice, but they could all motor, which was, which was nice. So I knew I was in a good place at, at Bob's Academy. I knew these guys, there was no nonsense. They were questioning everything that was being taught. You know, even within class, there was, we'd be questioning everything we were doing. And it was, it was such a mix of everything. We'd get sticks out, bashing with sticks. Then we'd hit pads. Then we'd do some knife work. Then we'd be on the floor in a headlock. Then we'd spar. You know, it was just such a mix of everything. It was like so real to me from what I'd come from. 
it was so real. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Did you ever get into uh, any altercations where you had to uh, use it in those early years? Yeah, but, you know, the altercations I had weren't particularly... I mean, I had, you had your schoolboy ones, mm -hmm. you know, your schoolboy stuff where if it was a schoolboy fight, you could, you know, it was just a ruck, wasn't it? You'd yeah. pop someone, they'd pop you, uh, it'd be broken up. So nothing made... A lot of gesturing, a lot of posturing. You know, and then you have your schoolboy fights outside of school. And, you know, I had my nose broken in one of those by a bigger guy than me. You know, it, that's just part of the run of the mill. You just, you're in and out of scrapping, right? <laughs> but as I got older, I could talk my way out of most of the scrap. But I'm not really into discussing fights as such i i've used jeff thompson's fence like mm -hmm. this yeah i've yeah, used yeah. that i've used that and that's it it's just like i don't want any trouble pop done yeah pop and then do, 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 groin kick and you're out of there so i mean two shots thumbs groin gone yeah because yeah. it's, it's self it's self-protection isn't it yeah. self-protection you, you, you deal with the situation which is coming you know it's coming you're 100 percent sure it's coming He's already started shoving you. I pleaded, one, two, gone. And that was when I was 16. That was when I was 16. And, you know, you don't need any more than that. I, I, I don't like going into any topics of fights. All my fights were cage fights. You know, the, the fights where I was getting paid. Someone was going to pay me to get locked in a cage and, yeah. and have a ruck with someone. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny, isn't it, though? The first time, I mean, I think we've all, you know, we've all had altercations when we were younger. Probably not so much now because we just don't go out and we're all old. You, know? we don't, <laughs> you don't put yourself in those positions. But when you're younger, you know, um, sort of um, scraps outside after school and all that sort of stuff. But it's always, it's always funny, isn't it, going from a, a dojang to experience your first real fight and that adrenaline. How would you... Um, how, could you still remember how that felt and how you over, overcame it? Oh, it was horrible. It was horrible. I mean, I, I was a classic when the adrenaline kicks in, squeaky voice, legs shaking like crazy. That, that was like a classic. And obviously in the very early days, my early teens, it was fear. Yeah. That's all. Oh, that's what I called it, fear. Sure. But over, t over time, you slowly learn. Towards my late teens, I now understood no, the shaking legs, the shaking that sweaty palms, you know, my tunnel vision, all that kind of thing, squeaky voice, dry mouth. That's my body prefer preparing itself oh, yeah. for war. Yeah. It's preparing itself for war. You know, you're not going to feel pain. You know, it's that kind of thing. You're not going to feel pain, which is evident when I was fighting. I, it was great in the sense that because I was in, into philosophy, I, I, I'd kind of look at phrases like, does, does pain hurt? You know, and when you're fighting, it doesn't. You acknowledge it, but it doesn't hurt. Yeah, mm -hmm. it hurts after. It, hurt, it hurts. Hurts like hell. It hurts like hell now. Now we're over forty. <laughs> yes, and it hurts for the rest of your life as well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's funny. Eric Paulson said that to me. He said, uh, "For every fight you have, you gain a year's experience. So for every for every MMA fight you have, you gain a year's experience." So I thought, oh, if I fight four times a year or three times a year. Plus the years training. Well, that's four years for every year. Well, if I do that over this period of time, I'll get X number of years experience. What I fail to understand is your body also ages and deteriorates. <laughs> Accelerates that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in around like a grandmaster <laughs> when you should have been. <laughs> so how old were you then, Neil, when you got into the uh, MMA side? Uh, that would have been year 2000. But what we were doing was already kind of Jeet Kune Do was already steering. It was there anyway. Mm -hmm. We were already understanding that you need to grapple. So we, we, all, we were already grappling, even on a rudimental level. We were already doing, you know, judo grappling. And that's what jiu-jitsu is. It's just very refined. You know, it's judo mm -hmm. and a waza that's just refined and generated into a beautiful art. But um, at that time, it was rudimentary, but we were doing it already. I mean, the true JKD people were striking, they were grappling, plus they were doing all the other stuff. You know, the, the weaponry work, mm -hmm. they were going into... I say the true Jikundo people, uh, I'll take that back. There's different paths. On the Inner Santo lineage, the Dan and the Guru Inner Santo lineage, we were investigating everything. You know, we were doing everything. And they were the first guys. The first MMA event before the UFC in America was at the, uh, the Inner Santo Academy. 
Okay. That was there before the UFC. And that had I mean, I mean, even, even when you look at, like, Bruce Lee's early films, like, you know, like, Enter the Dragon, he was getting, you know, that first scene, Enter the Dragon, oh, when he, yeah, got that yeah. guy in the, he got that guy in an armbar, didn't he? No, and, it wasn't actually an armbar. It was a wrestling stock. It's oh, actually okay. A neck, it's actually a neck crank. Was yeah, it? it gets in a neck crank. It's a wrestling stock. But it's early MMA, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He knew the path. He knew the path where martial arts was going. He knew that path. Yeah. Okay. And um, how, so how did your uh, MMA career go? Yeah, it was okay. It was okay because well, I, you know, the period that I fought in was from a valet Tudo no hold barred era into a sport era. Yeah. So when I originally was fighting, the, there was a mentality in a lot of us, a lot of the fighters, insofar as we weren't fighting. It didn't matter if you lost. That was for a start. It didn't matter if you lost. Yeah. It was just. It was just everyone wanted to fight. So everyone was fighting and they were trying to improve themselves. So if you were coming up against someone who used to pro box, some fighters would say, yeah, I'm going to stand and box with him. Whereas nowadays you say, no, you don't stand with him. You take him down to win. Yeah. But a lot of the mentality in the original days over in the UK was this, we're testing our skills against people who are in, in their area. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that was very evident. So that's a very much a JKD mentality using the, the arena of, uh, mixed martial arts or back then Valet Tudo, using that arena as a laboratory to test our skills. So I had 16 or 17 fights, I think it was 16 fights. I had nine, nine wins, six losses, one draw. Yeah, and I, and I got the British title, thankfully. You know, that was, that was nice to leave with the British title. The UFC apparently had my tapes. My manager had got, got all my tapes over. But the time that that was sent over, there was no weight category for me. They have now, but back what, what, then. What, do you, what, do you, what did you used to fight at then? What weight? I, used to, I actually used to fight in a category I wasn't even. I used to fight in like under 65s. Right, I, yeah. I weighed 61, 62, 63. I was always around there, but I used to fight under 65. But, uh, you know, it, I, I remember fighting some people. I remember fighting a guy, an international fight with a guy from France. Oh, my God. He wasn't my weight, I tell you. He was huge. He was huge. <laughs> he makes up tree trunks. I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, how, how important would you say it, it was, you know, that, um, that your traditional background, um, how, how that played out in your MMA, in your MMA fights? Because we had, the, I mean, we have this conversation quite a lot with guests, you know, that, um, that, have, that have dabbled in, in, in mixed martial artists and have come from a traditional background. Um, because, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people that call themselves MMA fighters, <laughs> but when you actually delve into their past, that's, they, they just turned up at a gym one day, started kicking and punching the bag, mm. and got in the ring and tried lots of different stuff, but they never, they never sort of originated from a traditional background. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to know what your thoughts were and how, how, how you feel as that prepared you and, and how, how vital um, it was, I suppose. With regards to traditional, traditional is a funny term because Muay Thai is traditional. Yeah, no one can no one can argue that Muay Thai doesn't work or, you know, doesn't kind of like relate to fighting or that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So to me, traditional martial arts, they've all got their time and place and they've all got their reasoning. And you know that the top the top people in karate, taekwondo and any traditional martial art, they understand what they're doing when they go through their kata and forms. They mm. understand it's, it's the visualization. It's the visualization and the putting yourself in that kind of reality. Mm -hmm. It's that whether you do it ordered like a set pattern, like most styles have, they have, oh, you need to know this, this pattern, this pattern, this pattern, that's this pattern, or whether you do it more free flow where you're just kind of expressing yourself, you know, the roots and you free flow It's the visualization, you know, shadow boxes are a jab cross hook is a small pattern. You know, it's a mm -hmm. combination. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting you say, because you, you, so many people obviously, do like your forms and your catters and your patterns. But these days there is no visualization. They're just doing it because they're going to do it to get their next belt. That's in, in their mind. That's, that's what they're doing it for. Where I know certainly I have this, I have this dilemma with my students sometimes saying, look, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you know, you're supposed to, the idea of a pattern is you're performing moves against an imaginary opponent, the same, mm -hmm. the same height and weight as you. That's what yeah. you're supposed to be imagining, but it's getting them, I suppose, to understand that and think of it more of a, you know, these moves could, 
um, could potentially save your life because of the, the amount of repetition that you've done over well, time. Well, and that's it. It's, it's the, re, I mean, you know, you're, I'm sure you're aware, it's the recording of those moves and executing the pattern for the repetition. Yeah. Back when, before we had a VHS or, or Betamax Beta Max recorders, <laughs> that's how martial arts were recorded, weren't they? Using forms and cutters. Yeah. Uh, and as you progress through the, through the grades, you you then unlock the next level of moves. Mm. So you know that's what your pattern is. You know, yeah. as well as using it as a, as a platform. Now I think more and more, you know, that visualization. I think as, as a lot of people leave, have left that behind as martial arts has become more commercialized. But it's uh, you know I think you know, I think it's tricky. I think it's tricky as well, Jackson. Uh, uh, insofar as uh, if you don't visualize on a regular basis then you're not working that part of your brain. Mm. So then you're no, going to find definitely. it more difficult to visit, visualize. So, and we're taught not to visualize. Stop daydreaming. Oi, Billy, stop looking out the window. Quit daydreaming. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're taught, yeah. Not, yeah. we're taught not to. And, you know, our brain's always constantly shifting left brain, right brain, left brain, right brain. So when you're in your right brain, that's your kind of like, that's your time to daydream. You but, know what I mean? But- but we're going to have a generation of kids who, who will never daydream because there's always something to occupy their mind, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So just going, going back to, to, to the fight, and you mentioned, was it 10, 10 wins, one draw, and six losses? Nine wins, one draw, six losses. losses. Okay, so really, so one, one of the things I'm really keen on is, is look, examining failures. And I suppose a loss, you know, I've lost in martial arts and in competitive bouts. It's not, it's not, a, it's not an issue to me. But I actually come back. I learn from that. What, what went wrong? How can I prepare? Mm. What, what was your first loss, and, and how did it affect you? And how did you come back from it? And what did you take away from it? Oh, first loss was the best thing that happened to me. The best thing that happened to me. So not at the time, my... though. I bet. Um. No, with literally that night. Yeah. That night, I felt, I felt, I felt it. Oh, I felt just, ah, oh, I've got a weight off me. Okay. It just felt like I had a weight off me. Okay. So I'd, I'd had one fight already, and I'd won by triangle strangle in the first round. So I'd, that fight I'd had, and then after that fight, I, I just booked myself that fight to test where I am. And I was like, okay, I'm there. Two days later, I get a phone call from the promoter. Okay, we've got another show. Then would you like to go? I'm like, uh, oh, okay. So. Then I've been reeled in. Now that's it. Then you're in, right? Mm-hmm. Once, you've, yeah. once you've agreed to that second one, then you're in. You're like, oh, now you're on the path. Whereas originally it was just, I just wanted to test. I wanted to have an experience in it. I'm a JKD guy. I should at least experience all out fighting to be able to say that, well, I've done that, right? Yeah. You know, especially at my age and my, my physical ability, I was at healthy. I, I was fairly healthy. So, you know, usual injuries as everyone else. But I felt that, Come on, guys! It, it, I'm a healthy guy. Step it up. Step up. Represent. Represent. Represent the art. Represent Guru and Asano, mm-hmm. Bob Green, all your fellow instructors. You know, because they're they're obviously older. They'd represented in karate and boxing and judo competition throughout the past because that's all you could do. But now we're in a day where I felt I needed to step up. I needed to step up for the community. So anyway, <clears throat> second fight. I was ill. My opponent was ill, Danny Batten. Danny Batten's an awesome martial artist. If you could get him on, he'd be great to interview. He now coaches a high-level uh, a mixed martial arts school. You know, he's okay. got fighters in Bellator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's doing fantastic. Lovely guy. But we both shouldn't have been fighting. He was having whatever issues. <coughs> but both of us should not have taken that fight and should not have fought. So we both turn up and we have a barn burner of a scrap. Barn burner of a scrap. It really was. It was just, you know, balls to the wall. Right. Yeah, and he beat me by armbar. Okay. He beat me by. He mounted me. He broke his hand or fractured his hand on my face. My face went like this. I mean, it was it was a barn burner of a battle. And he got the armbar in the end. He broke my arm, and that that was it. The weight was off me. I had I must have had about hundred fans come and watch me because it was local to me. It was being held at High Wycombe Judo Centre, and I live in Elsby, so just up the road. Yeah. yeah. So lost the fight weight off my head suddenly you're not invincible ah and then from there it didn't matter from there it was like you can fight any time now yeah. you can fight tomorrow you can fight three months it doesn't matter whether you win lose or draw now you've got it and from then on fantastic from then on it was it was like i i, I could just i could just compete whenever i wanted to compete now i'd already been a world champion 
and European champion and British champion in stick fighting. I've had over over 200 stick fights by then. So I traveled the world stick fighting. So I was already used to the adrenaline and facing opponents in, you know, Manila and yeah. all over the Philippines, etc. So I was, I was used to that kind of competitive thing. So the fear thing, that was cool. That was cool. The, the thing that was affecting me would have been the ego. Oh, win, lose. Oh, who am I going to upset? The, oh. fear, the fear of fear. Yeah. The failure of losing. The fear of what other people think. Yeah. which is the biggest fear we all have the fear of what other people think of us yeah and it stops a lot of people from doing a lot of things that does yeah don't, sure. don't be the nail that stands out above the rest stuff that stuff that be the nail live your truth have fun life's short right that's it yeah. so you stop competing and obviously because age catches up with everybody as both gavin and i know so how did that um, affect your martial arts journey and what did you, what did that divert you into uh, <laughs> When I stopped competing, that was due to just my body wearing down, as you say. You, mm -hmm. Your body just wears down. And I'd kind of done it. I'd, I, I, I'd done it. I didn't really want to continue competing. So for me, I just wanted to... Uh, oh, I, I wanted to just progress in the arts. Just progress in the arts. Just learning the, the history. Uh, nothing else had changed in my life insofar as... You know, my business, I was continuing on with my business, still teaching uh, various styles of martial arts. So I'm teaching Eric Paulson's combat submission wrestling, teaching uh, Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do, teaching Filipino martial arts and teaching Muay Thai. So they were kind of my core thing. And then teaching a mix of that for kids. Kids yeah. get a mix of it. They get the whole lot. So they, the kids actually get MMA. Okay. <laughs> okay. And when did you, when did you launch your school then? Was that something you just did that? Uh, uh, what? I was teaching from 1994. Yeah. Yeah. So once I got my uh, black belt under Bob Breen, yeah, I started teaching straight away because, you know, reading the philosophy and that it was that's when you start to learn when you start to teach. That's when you really start to turn. So giving back, you know, you have to have you have to do that to actually understand the art, to actually okay. master the art. The the teachings is essential. Okay. And so and so, at what point did you? I know we've not mentioned your good lady wife. So when did you meet? Uh, Rachel and obviously she's a she's a martial arts practitioner as well. What yeah. how did how did that come about? Well, I met her around a friend's house. I was I was going to uh, one of my oldest friends, one of my buddies. I've known him since I was eight years old, and I I'd met him around there around uh, around his house and met her there. Now I was in the process and training to go to the Philippines to find the world championships in 1998, and so it was in the summer of 98 that I met her just before I was going to go. But uh, so far as Rachel, I knew the moment I saw her, she was 17 years old. Uh, but I knew straight away that when she walked into the room, I saw her and I was just like, Oh no, I know. It's, yeah. This is not, this yeah. Is, she's she's mine. <laughs> yeah. I'll fight you. I'll fight you for her. <laughs> roll, roll the credits of seven brides for seven brothers <laughs> i'll just bag her and <laughs> she's mine I, as long as i do it to song it's all right right <laughs> yeah. and, and does rachel work in the academy with you then does she yeah we've we've worked together all the time we don't actually have our own full-time school anymore we okay. had a full-time school for 10 years and uh the council knocked the building down so we moved into someone else's gym and we're teaching there but that didn't work out too well so we're actually now back in a church hall until lockdown and actually it's it's quite a it's quite a poetic because i'm in the hall that i first started teaching at at the church where we were married and the church where i was an altar boy when i was a kid so it's quite oh, a really are, yeah quite Full romantic, circle quite romantic i'm back teaching in the church hall where i first started teaching but i'm not at the moment obviously due to lockdown <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean so. you've certainly i mean just talking about lockdown i mean that's how that's how i first first saw you through social media you know, every um, every time I logged onto Facebook, you were there, you and your wife in the living room with sticks or dirty boxing or grappling or something was always going on <laughs> in your living room. I think I know your living room better than you now. <laughs> I, I think my, my living room was more over Christmas. The rest is in the garage. Yeah. We've got, we've got a cage down the side and we've got the red mats. That's, that's our, uh, our home dojo. That's it. So how often do you guys train, you know, like sort of at home then? You know, uh, I'm so blessed insofar as Rachel is a martial artist. Yeah. And that comes through me. I mean, I, I'll tell you the story. When we, uh, when we got together, my, my, my front room in my bachelor pad, <laughs> wooden dummy, mats, grappling dummy, 
I mean, the whole place was just, I'd teach privates from there. I'd move the sofa into the hallway, move the wooden dummy out in the hallway, teach privates in the front room. She'd have to go upstairs into the one bedroom we had in our maisonette. <clears throat> and when we had our child, our first daughter, again, she was up there. We got married within a year of meeting each other. Brilliant. Wow. Year. We, we met on the 8th of August and we got married on the 31st of July. Her dad's birthday. <laughs> As long, as long as he liked you, he must have liked you then. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you know what? We both knew, both me and Rachel knew, and it just had needed time for them to know. And I think, uh, I think that's been evident now that, you know, the path Rachel's taken, she's a European champion, a British champion, and, uh, you know, she's traveled all over the world. And she's now, she's now renowned in the JKD community as being one of the best women out there. And, and she is, because, I, I, you know, I'm on the receiving end of her. But when we first got together, she wasn't training. I'd be using her. I'd tell Rachel, can I do this? Now, when I do this, could you do that? And can I do this little drill with you? And after about, it could have been two, three years, maybe more, I said to her, look, you're better and you know more than my students. And you're not even training. You should take this up. Because she, was, she knew it. She was doing it. I needed her to know it because I was just using her as, you know, a full guy. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of what we do in uh, JKD and Carly and stuff is a relationship thing, especially energy drills, the close range stuff. You need a partner to kind of play off to work those drills for yeah. high reps. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I it's had to it's been lucky focus. over lockdown, right? That's for sure. Perfect. And yeah. But to tell you the truth, over lockdown, we both have only done personal training. Yeah. Okay. Other than over Christmas when you saw a spa, what we were doing was trying to test ourselves insofar as, well, she didn't realize this by the way, but uh, I was, uh, I was trying to do just the stuff that the guys online do. Yeah. Just the stuff with the same kind of equipment that the guys online have got. Cause I've got my own grappling dummy, my own proper grappling dummy, but I made my own for yeah. my students. I've got my own Wing Chun dummy. I made my own with chairs and continue to do everything on chairs Brilliant. because I wanted to know the guys at home, you can still do this. Yeah. We can work around this. So it. It that way. It's a really good idea, to be honest. I'm, yeah. um, I'm, I'm keen, I'm keen to know. I'm, I'm conscious of, uh, I'm conscious of time, but um, I'm definitely keen to um, hear a little bit about when you first went over to meet uh, uh, Dan Insano and Dan Insanto, get his name yeah. right. Dan Insanto, uh, Insanto right? Is that it? Guru Dan, uh, we call him. Guru Dan. Guru Dan, yeah, because again, obviously, he was uh, he was someone that trained along Bruce, along, alongside Bruce Lee, knew him really well, um, and I would, is certainly one person that I would love to love to train with. So, uh, how was how was that an experience? Fantastic, just fantastic. I mean, I first went to his academy in '96 when I fought in uh, the stick fighting championships, the screaming championships in LA. Because it, it goes '94, I went to the Philippines and fought, got two bronzes. Then 96, went to LA, got the gold. And then 98, went back to the Philippines, got the silver. <laughs> Lost my title in, 96, in 98, but that's cool. But in 96, when I was in LA, I went and trained with Paul Vunak, private with Paul Vunak at his house. Uh, I trained at Guru Dan's Academy and all in his classes for one day. And I trained, went down and trained with Higgin Machado. Okay. at their school in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in 1906. So just to experience that. So the ball started to roll. And I trained with Eric Paulson there as well. Because Bob Breen said to me, he said, when you go to LA, make sure you check out Eric. And Eric's just like, oh, outstanding. Wow. Yeah. Did he, did, he, um, did he show you any of his nunchucker tricks? <laughs> no, no, no. Who, Eric? <laughs> no, uh, no, Guru Dan. Guru Dan. No, well, we swung a stick. And that's what a nunchucker is. It's a broken stick. It's a yeah. rattan stick that's broken and flayed and you've still got your flexible weapon. So that's what the nunchucker is. So yeah, we did in that sense. <laughs> has he, has he got any, um, any, any good stories that you can, um, that you can tell us about Bruce Lee? I'd say the best, uh, one of the best stories I heard was he stood at a distance and he said, and he stood at a ridiculous distance from his, uh, his partner and he kept walking back walking back and he stood there and he said, you know, before I met Bruce Lee at this distance, I felt safe. And it was a ridiculous distance. And he, he said, Bruce would observe your breathing, your blinking, and you'd breathe 
at the wrong time, or no, not at the wrong time, you'd breathe, blink, and he'd be on you. He'd be there. He'd be there. And there was another time he said that uh, he jabbed at Bruce. He went boom, and Bruce's head was on his jab. He'd entered it on the retraction of his jab. He'd gone up, yeah. and he'd followed back on his jab with his head, wailing away to his body. And it's, uh, I mean, there's so many stories I've heard from Guru Dan. I mean, we could talk all day on it, but uh, I mean, just, just, just some stories. And I'm not, they sound fanciful, but I, I you know, no, I, I can there's some good I mean, substance behind them. I've been there with Guru Dan and I've watched him do stuff, and I'm just like, how, what? How did, how did he do that? You know, they're just geniuses, these guys. They really so, are. So g given, you know, your, your martial arts career and, and the journey that you've been on it and continuing on still, because it, it doesn't end, does it? It's, 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 it's a lifestyle. It's something for life. What continues to motivate you? My identity, who I am. I, I, I am a martial artist. So that's my identity. So everything I do stems from that. Yeah, everything I do. You know, even even the even the downtimes, as in like when you're chilling, when you just sit back, you're having a beer. I'm a martial artist. The down, no, no, someone's going to take that wrong, aren't they? They're going to go, "Oh my boy!" <laughs> Neil <laughs> said, "Neil says we can party." <laughs> earn your downtime. A martial art. What the warrior code? You, you you have to know when's family time, when's work time. You know, when's when's research and reading time. When's working out time when's meditation time when's you know when you need to know these kinds of things it's a fine balance and that's that's what a martial artist is to me it's it's not just you know the art of war it's it's there's something it's the art of life isn't it yeah there's something there's a real good guidance there it's it's almost it's almost like a religion almost but i wouldn't class it as a you know set in that kind of rock stone you know Oops. It's a cult. Yeah. Isn't it? It's a cult, <laughs> yeah. but you know you're not set in that, and that's what that's one thing I like about uh, the JKD philosophy is you're not set in a cult. I pay respects to Muay Thai. I pay respects to the Bruce Lee arts. I pay respects, you know, to the Filipino arts, etc. But that, I'm just paying respects to that kind of life, that the people that have gone before. Me. What What do you think? What do you think it is that um, <coughs> uh, JKD has not really been commercialized? Has it like karate and Taiko Dan, what do you think? What do you think that is? Because obviously, you'd think, knowing that it's come from Bruce Lee, you think it would be the thing that everyone would want to jump into. But it's never really gone down that commercial route. It seemed to st still stay quite niche, hasn't it? Yes, I think in the nineties, the nineties, especially in the UK, was huge for JKD and and for Filipino arts. That was a, there was a massive growth in it. Then the JKD idea of being well rounded in all in all areas started to become evident through UFC and other events. Then that started to evolve into a specific, almost, almost set style in itself. Do you know what I mean? Where you've got these certain arts that fit into that kind of framework. Okay. Yeah. Then out of that, that's kind of like sport JKD now. We got sport JKD, and I think it's even more sport JKD now. I'm talking about uh, an idea, a philosophy, not the art of Jeet Kune Do as from Bruce Lee, as in the way of the intercepting fist. What I'm talking about is just being well-rounded in all areas of combat, okay. on one-on-one -on -one combat, on a matted area, in a well-lit area with a referee against another professional athlete who knows on what day and how you fight at this certain time. Can you see? Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, MMA is not, it's, it's real fighting, but as we know, it's, it's, it's not real fighting, but it's real fighting. Do you know what I mean? Yes, there's, there's, it's, there's it's, it's real combat, but it's, you're not combat. in a, a fighting scenario. Yeah, yeah. But, and, but, it's, but it's preempted. It's the closest, it's the closest to a laboratory, a safe laboratory that we can do at this yeah. moment in time, at yeah. this moment in time. And we already know that the JKD stuff worked. Every round, someone gets kicked in the groin, someone gets finger jabbed in the eye. But uh, there you go. So we know that. So let's not worry about that. Let's practice the, the punching, the kicking. But what we're seeing now, we've now got a new... Sorry, guys, we're, got, we're getting close to time. I'm fine. I can stay all day, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. On, on that note, then, I'll ask the final question. 
And somebody we ask every single guest on the show, what advice would you give to a younger you, 16, 15, 16, 17, given your experiences and the journey that you've been on now? What advice would you give to a younger you? Uh, trust the path that you're already on. Trust the path that you're already on. Make the same mistakes you're already on. Meet the same people. Do the, do the same. Do exactly the same. Trust, trust yourself and continue. That's what I'd say. Fantastic. That's what I'd say. Because what, what that, that path has done what, what, and what everyone's life has done has led them to where they are now. And I can honestly say if I passed away tomorrow, I would pass away happy because I've got, I've got such a fantastic life. E even though like, it, it looks like the world is collapsing around us, you know, I look at what I've got in my life. I have my I've married my best friend. I've, I don't work. You know, I, I, I teach. I've still got a medium to teach people <coughs> online. I can still pass on my information to people and all the children that would help. It's, uh, I'm blessed. And I've got two beautiful daughters that have gone on to excel in whatever they've gone to do. And, you know, I, I am truly blessed with my life. And my main thing was to meet Guru Dan in Asanto, to train with him. That was my main thing to meet, you know, the guy that really helped in, was one of the main guys in the, the Jeet Kune Do thing because Bruce Lee was my idol. He was my yeah. kind of like my life coach from the grave. And I met him and then, you know, I got my, I got my full instructorship under Guru Dan uh, the other year and I'd, that, I've, I'd done what I wanted to do. Brilliant, I've, brilliant. I've, made, I've made my mark in what I want to make. So if I passed away tomorrow, I'd, I'd pass away quite happy. So, but I'm not finished yet. I no, ain't finished yet, folks. I ain't going nowhere. Well, stay in, stay in. Just don't go outside. Don't go outside. <laughs> don't get in the, don't get in the hospitals. <laughs> you know what? I, I was going to take their advice. Stay in, protect, act like you've got the virus and just stay in bed all day. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'd be too boring though, for virus. sure. I'm, I'm a good citizen, look. <laughs> Stay Neil, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Really appreciate it. It's been, it's been a great insight. It really has. And I think, you know, you've definitely got more stories that we need to get out of you. I think I can, I can feel a part two. Hey, pa a part two there. with the, uh, with the good lady wife, maybe. Yeah, that'd be really uh, we'll interesting. Drag on. We'll yeah. drag her on. Yeah, Neil, brilliant. thank you very much, sir. Much appreciated. Thanks, Neil. It's my pleasure. Thank you, guys. My thank honor. You. Thank you. Take it. I hope you all enjoyed this week's episode of the Motivated Martial Artist podcast. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page and our Facebook group, the Motivated Martial Artist podcast. And don't forget also the Motivated Martial Artist Instagram page. So head along for some extra content, interviews and much more. So until next week, it's bye from Jackson and Gavin, the Motivated Martial Artists. <laughs>